The following presentation of City Cinematech is made possible in part by the cooperation of the Czech Center of New York, the National Film Archives, Prague, the State Fund for Cinematography of the Ministry of Culture of the Czech Republic, and Czech Television. Welcome to City Cinematech, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, it's our pleasure to present the 1970 Czech film, The Ear, directed by Karo Kachina. This is an extraordinary film for, among other reasons, the fact that it wasn't seen until 1990. It was, in short, a film banned for 20 years. Why would it be banned? I think that'll be fairly clear after you've seen the film. If I had to describe it in a phrase, this film is as if Francis Ford Coppola's The Conversation uh, was mixed with Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. It's an extraordinary film in terms of its acting, its dialogue, its political implications, and its cinematic style. We'll be able to talk about that and a set of other things after today's screening. It's a pleasure to welcome to City Cinematheque Milena Jelinek, Professor of screenwriting at Columbia University. Now, take this unusual opportunity to see a film that was banned for 20 years and that deserves our attention, The Ear. Welcome back to Cine Cinematheque. And I think I would be scared, too. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, about this thrilling uh, and very, very rich film in the next 30 minutes. Here to talk about these things with us is Professor Milena Jelinek. Uh, Milena teaches screenwriting at uh, Columbia University, and uh, she is, of course, a screenwriter her, herself. Her most uh, recent um, produced uh, work is Forgotten Light, which was released in the Czech Republic in 1996. Uh, um, and has been shown here, but unfortunately for us, not released here yet, Milena, yet. yet right. right. Uh, and as some of our viewers may have ascertained from my introduction, uh, you are from the Czech Republic originally yes, as well. Let, let's start with what I think might be the most obvious question to uh, viewers, North American viewers, seeing this film, uh, which represents a period now 30 years ago, is how accurate is this film? How, what is the relationship between this film and the lived reality of a number of those years in what was then Czechoslovakia? So first of all, the film was really told by someone who had a very intimate experience or a very intimate knowledge. So I would assume that it's very accurate. The feelings of uh, not knowing who's behind you, who's following you, who's listening to you, uh, all that was uh, actually prevalent during the 50s in Czech Republic. But of course, this is what happened in the exalted circles, so to speak. Uh, the author of the screenplay, um, Procházka, actually was uh, a member of the Communist Party and was a, a very active in the 50s and um, made his way to the, to the elite. Uh, he was a, a member, the the youngest member of the committee, of the party, wow. central committee, and knew very, very well on a personal level the, the former president of Czechoslovakia, Novotny. So I, I assumed all these uh, scenes where he portrays this, this very absurd party, this very absurd reception with its folksiness and joviality that covers up the fact that they are killers Absolutely. is really something that he had seen on his own eyes. Um, uh, 
many people, I think, for for the Americans, I, I just am not quite clear how they look at it, whether they look at it as fiction. Uh, but this this type of uh, persecution, of course, right. happened. And uh, usually people only remember the communists that were put on trial, the Slansky trial, where they, they took uh, uh, very many uh, people who were Jews and, and accused them of various sins and actually executed them. But there were other people as well who were less unceremoniously listened to they were just done away with. They right. were put in prisons for very, very long sentences. So this kind of terror did exist. Okay. Now, this uh, screenwriter has a, a long and special relationship with Karel Kahina, the, the director. Uh, what, what's the nature of that? I mean, they worked together for a long time. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how they met, uh, but they met sometimes in the middle of the 50s. And at that time, I think Prochaska already became a kind of a chosen one, the protected one. And there are two very funny stories that tell how he became this, this um, you know, protege of the president. Uh, one says that the president's wife mentioned one day to, to her husband that there was some Prochaska on the radio who spoke very nicely about you and you ought to invite him for a chat. So his secretary went out to get some Prochaska and got a wrong one. Uh, this young Prochaska came in and was very charming, very enthusiastic. He had a great, you know, personal charm, and the president was captivated. So it didn't matter that it was. It a was the wrong guy. So, so that's story number one. The second, this is like from Schweik. The second right. is from Kafka. Uh, uh, Prochaska was as a young. Um, uh, you know, young communist, was at a public meeting where he attacked a very high official. He, he clearly was quite courageous and right. uh, risked a lot. And at that meeting, Novotny was also present, and he, of course, Prochaska didn't know it, but Novotny already wanted to liquidate this high official. Oh, okay. So when this happened, Novotny came to Prochaska and kissed him in public. So this is, you know, the kiss. It's straight from Kafka. I Abs think. Absolutely, yeah. and 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 one must say it could also be straight from the film we just uh, we just saw right. because one of the things that has always uh, interested me in watching Czech film, particularly from this extraordinary period of the 1960s, is the degree to which, uh, how do you want to say it, the Kafka's influence or the Kafka as sensibility or the way in which Kafka captured certain elements of the culture uh, returns time and time again to the films. While they're not adaptations of Kafka, it's as if they are uh, lost short stories or lost the lost scripts of Franz Kafka um, that had never somehow been produced. Of course, those things don't exist, but that's really much the the impression one gets uh, from this kind of this this kind of thing. Yeah, well, there is a certain affinity, but it is built in because uh, the, the socialism and communism in um, Czechoslovak Republic at the time was a direct inheritor of various Nazi methods. Right. And the Nazi methods already are a result of certain atmospheres, certain set of mind that existed in Central Europe before. So I think, you know, there is a string from Kafka, not that Kafka would have imagined these things oh, would no, have done it differently, no. but yes, there <laughs> no. is a connection. A absolutely, and of course, it's one of those things that uh, uh, p other people in the world have um, uh, responded to very strongly as as well. I've had the experience of chatting with any number of Latin American friends who have uh, said that when they first read Spanish translations of Kafka, they didn't know how he could have known so much about them and what they had had to put up with a variety of different um, of different of different regimes. But let's go back. <laughs> To the, Czech, uh, yes. to, to the Czech Republic. Uh, Kahina has himself a very interesting career. He's a very prolific director, and he's made many, many films. Yes, well, he started before he met Prochaska. He made several films, then they met. 
and they started making films that were uh, certainly had higher aspirations. They wanted to try out certain approaches, certain formalistic and experimental approaches that they knew about. Uh, Škvorecki, who is a Czech writer uh, who wrote about them, mentioned that they, they were like a middle-aged new wave. I mean, they were slightly older, right. very serious, and were working various things through in the collaboration. So they were working for something like maybe 14 years together before they made the year. And if you, I think you've shown a long live Republic. That's correct. Where you could see that the experimental concerns, the kind of inner monologue, the yes. flashbacks, the slightly altered reality through the flashback, or they already tried there. Uh, the, the kind of approach, the, this, the, you know, the air of disillusionment, the sense of betrayal and all that is there too. It's just a strange film because it's through the eyes of the young boy. And there I think uh, the flashbacks or the, in Long or the, of the dreams Republic, yeah. in Long Republic were not as smooth and elegant and organic as they were in the, in the, uh, in the year, where I think it's really remarkable how these pieces are joined together and with what, with what irony and exaggeration uh, they portray the world of this elite, these, these, these people who, you know, who appear to them distorted. Absolutely. It's just very clear. Well, that's, that's one of the things I, I find so interesting about the film is that this is a film that has um, multiple points of view. I mean, not in the, in the way of it being uh, large segments like Kurosawa's Rashomon. Here is so-and-so's story, then here is so-and-so's story. But rather, we have this couple. Uh, clearly, the, the husband is the key, is the key figure in, uh, in this. And yet, we are always drifting between the two. What is the wife observing? What is the husband observing? And then, even within what they observe, the film has different modes of observation. So sometimes, for example, when we have the flashbacks to the party, we have the optical point of view shots in which people come up and address him, but of course we're put in the position of the camera. And so this heightens, and sometimes it's a wide angle lens, so this heightens the sense of the assault and of the, of the, of the absurdity. It also puts us as spectators in the position allied with him, so we're piecing this together as he's piecing it together. Of, of what was the significance of all of this? Well, it's an expression of fear. He understands that something is happening, but what is happening? He doesn't quite know. For a little while, he doesn't, or at least we don't know in those flashbacks before we get to know that there were some changes uh, ab among ministers and so forth. And that's very interesting to, to watch. Absolutely. And I, I, th I think you're, you're correct on that point. And that is one of the things that makes the experience of this film so unusual. Because uh, in the American cinema is really quite brilliant. Um, and even when it's a, a British American director like Hitchcock, in setting up suspense in which we know that Sigourney Weaver has to get the little girl back from the, what I call the space dragon in, in Aliens. But we know exactly that there's the dragon there and that the object is doing this. We know what the task is. We know what the dangers attendant to the task is. Whereas here, we're put in this sense of dread in that something is terribly wrong. But the definition of what that is and what its consequences will be is given to us by accretion. And, and, and sometimes the addition of a new piece of information doesn't clarify anything, it merely complicates it. As I think the rather brilliant ending of the film, which is supposed to be officially when you're told you're, you've just been appointed minister of something, and this is a, an ambitious bureaucrat, clearly, well, that's supposed to be a very happy thing. And 
the last words are, I'm scared. Because she says, well, how could they appoint you if they have heard these things? So once again, we're at that point in which there are multiple possibilities at the end, none of which are pleasant. No, it's a very unpleasant film, actually. Yes. It's quite painful. I've seen it several times. The first time I was quite taken by it and, and you know, the tension yes. that is produced is, is very high. The second time I was more aware of, of the characters, of, of the discrepancy between her and him. And neither, her, neither the woman or, nor the uh, man are very admirable. I mean, they are very flawed people. Absolutely. And it's, it's, and to, to see them, and you know, you go from one point to the other one, you, you have almost a feeling just before he thinks that he's going to be now taken away, that they at least have some kind of human contact where you finally see them embrace, right. where you finally see them talk as normal people. But then again, it goes aside. Then again, you know, there, there are these policemen who come in, who behave in a terrible way. All of a sudden, he identifies himself with them. Therefore, again, you see a different dimension of him. It's a very unpleasant film to watch. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the characters from a perspective that you can add to our knowledge, and I couldn't possibly because I don't uh, speak Czech. Uh, at all, and I believe there are aspects, there are always aspects of language when it's translated into subtitles uh, that we miss. Nuances of social position, of accent, of region, of, of, atti uh, of attitude. What are some of the things about the backgrounds or natures of these characters that a non-Czech speaker might miss? Or just hinted at, but that a, that a Czech speaker would uh, and certainly who knew people of this era would say, aha, I know this about them. Well, first of all, there is a certain coarseness and vulgarity in, the voc in her vocabulary. I mean, she's very straightforward and in a way that, again, is not quite pleasant to hear. She goes after him. I mean, she demands various f favors from him, but in a very in elegant and uh, way, uh, but it's not only a question of that, it's a question of intonation. She has this very contemporary Prague intonation mm -hmm. or from, you know, uh, not, not somebody who watches her uh, verbal expressions. She's marvelously played by this uh, actress, Yuzina Bohdalova, who is really who is still acting and who, who went through many roles. So you have this feeling that this is a woman who is of a certain lower class. Right. Uh, but at the same time, she has these very genuine, straightforward feelings. She certainly sees through him. She certainly is worried about what the wife of the minister is doing. What about her children? She is somebody who is genuine, but not elegant. Okay. Whereas he is, I mean, she's a very elegant woman right. as, as in her appearance, but in the way she expresses herself. Um, whereas he is very guarded. Um, in, in some sense, his delivery is flat. Uh, is, you don't feel any traces of any accents. Uh, occasionally, through anger, he uses also a kind of uh, put downs right. more than, than vulgar, but really, you know, the kind of common put down. So it's very interesting to watch these two people. And then it's interesting to watch the elite, the so called president. That's really hilarious. I mean, the mixture, <laughs> I know that it's not a hilarious film, but the mixture of this kind of folksiness and the stupidity of the ideas, you know, is, is so cleverly observed. Yes, I mean, indeed. It's just, it's just lovely to, to hear. <laughs> well, um, in the case of, of, of the male protagonist, would this be because he is, um, you know, he's, as we've said before, he's clearly very ambitious and has found what he thinks is his path to rise within the power structure of the party, and so he is, uh, in a certain sense, erasing whatever past 
he would have to sort of neutralize himself because the, the neutral, in a certain sense, can take on the color of whatever needs be taken on at the, at, at the moment. Yeah, well, he is an apparatchnik, so he, he is striving to do what is expected of him to do. And he is probably uh, a, 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 the man of the next wave that came over. He is much more of a bureaucrat, much more of the apparatchnik. He is right. not the folksy killer as right. these other ones were before. Right, and those folksy killers would have been people instrumental in 1948 and then in right. the purges in the, 19, in the, 50s, 19, in the right. 1950s. Right. Well, President Novotny, for instance, participated uh, in the trials against Slansky. You know, they were all uh, involved in, in these trials. Yeah, and one, one should say that there is a, a very fine film by uh, Costa Gavras. Yes, I know. Yes. Uh, that's, yes. That's, based on, uh, that's based on those incidents yes. um, in Czechoslovakia, and which, alas, is not in distribution at this, at right. this moment. But perhaps it'll come confession, back. Confession. The Confession, yes, the confession. based upon uh, the book by Arthur London, right. which was his memoirs of, those, right. of that particular terrible, uh, horrible incident uh, in history. Now, you teach screenwriting, and one of the things I know that as a screenwriter and writer of screen uh, and teacher of screenplay writing is that you pay a great deal of attention to structure, 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 structure. We've talked a bit about characterization, who these people are, how, how that works. I think this is also a very intricate film in its structure. What do you admire or, or think is most interesting about the film from that angle? Well, first of all, it's almost like a play uh, because of the limited um, environment in the house. Of course, we have the uh, flashbacks that, that add space to it. But it's also very clear conflict that undergoes constant evolutions between these two people. You were right to compare it to Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf because it's this or... Uh, a journey into night. I yes. mean, it's it's a it has this intensity of that you, in in that one night where people have to really look into their hearts and find out who they are, and I think that we do find out. Oh, and I, that's why it's you know that's why this film is so disturbing. And I think uh, one should say it's it's disturbing if one wants to say at a several levels. That is, certainly it's disturbing as a chronicle of a set of particular despicable political practices. But at the same time, it's, it's years later, and the way in which that's also the context that reveals who they are as characters is also important. I mean, there, there is to say there's a political drama going on here, but there's also a human drama going right. on. And the way in which they wrap, the two wrap around one another yes. is constantly, and, and as you pointed out earlier, just at a moment in which you think they've sided on the human, the political enters again with a vengeance. The, the security, drunken security officers uh, show up, or they receive a telephone call, or they discover, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, micro, the, 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 the microphone, microphone yes. uh, when, they drop, when they drop the fork. All of that, and that continues to alter in one, I don't think it's too strong to say, pervert the human right. um, in, in, in those ways. Well, let's go back to, to something about the, uh, the structure of the play-like thing. I was struck by, as I am frequently by the uh, Czech cinema of that epoch and Czech cinema, by the uh, visual sophistication of this, uh, of this film. Because uh, while we're in one space that you could, in a certain sense you could say, oh, it all takes place in a house, mm -hmm. and there's a certain way in which you could maybe rewrite it all into one space. That's not actually how the film takes place. They use the entire house, mm -hmm. and I find that um, Kahina has an enormously dynamic sense of space. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, the space always seems inflected. Uh, there's a way in which he's a uh, near expressionist director, mm -hmm. that, the, that the, the feelings of the characters seem to be projected onto the space um, as, as well. Uh, so I find the fact that we have the uh, sequences which are so dark, I mean, quite literally, because the lights are off. Right. You're, in a certain sense, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> well, um, 
I think it's built on contrast, right? It's, uh, he used, it's almost Jungian. They enter through the cellar, they enter through the laundry, the dark laundry, uh, and then they walk up. But that sense of, you know, that, that danger downstairs is always present. So I think uh, the play with light, the suspense about, or, you know, what, what happened to the light, how come the lights are over there in the other, um, that I think works very well. And also what I think is beautiful that it's black and white because Absolutely. that sense of uh, night, that sense of darkness is there constantly. Well, the, uh, among the many languages I don't speak, <laughs> German's yet another one, but there is a, a, a word frequently used by um, uh, English language critics, etc., which is unheimlich, which means, um, as it's been translated for me, a not at homeness. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to the sense of dread we were talking about earlier. Because what are they doing in the film is that they are returning to the place in which you are supposed to feel your maximum level of comfort, your home. It is but the that's not their home. Oh, that's okay. a government villa. Well, yes, because of the level so, he functions. And at. in fact, you have the first hint that she has that something is afoot is when she tells about this woman, this comrade, somebody, who called her and do you know what she asked me? Whether the house is warm in the winter. That means that, that already somebody is speculating that they are on their way out. So the sense, you know, the fact that there is such disorder, right. that there is, you know, that there is all this dirt, all this confusion, all these things in that house also indicate this is not a beautiful house uh, somewhere in the French countryside that had been occupied for centuries. That's right, yeah. This is exactly how it feels to live in Czech Republic or in Czechoslovakia, where some inhabitants of that villa have perished. Whoever, right. whatever it was, is gone. Maybe they were Jews, maybe the Germans took it over, maybe it then was returned to some original owners. Now it belongs to the, to the government. So again, I think the sense of being lost in that space, you know, not being cozy, not being at home, is actually expressed through through this art decor, which absolutely. is very realistic. Oh, absolutely. And that's, I think, one of the accomplishments is the way in which these such modest objects within the house become signs of the dread, signs of their, of their fear, a question about just a, a little window open or a light or the connection between electricity of the house and the telephone raise so many questions that focus about how, how um, perilous, the, perilous their state, um, their state right. is. Well, I also think we don't have just about a, about a minute. I think we should comment, um, well, I should just say, is there anything else that you admire about the film that you haven't had a chance to say yet? Well, I first of all regret that uh, the film hasn't been seen for so long because when, it's, when it was opened in 1990, I think, it was already behind everybody. Even the Czechs in Czech Republic feel as if they don't have time to deal with these problems. You know, and we, we've had time to show it, but we've now run out of time. If you'd like more information about this series, please drop us a line. Drop it to City Cinematheque, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. Let me give you that information again. Drop us a line. Drop it to City Cinematheque, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. Malena, I want to thank you for being here and for bringing the kind of uh, aesthetic, political, and cultural knowledge that we cherish so much in our guests here. It's been a great pleasure having you here. Thank you. And I hope that you join us again here soon on City Cinematheque. Thanks for joining us today.
The preceding presentation of City Cinematheque was made possible in part by the cooperation of the Czech Center of New York, the National Film Archives, Prague, the State Fund for Cinematography of the Ministry of Culture of the Czech Republic, and Czech Television.